I've been involved with these conferences for about 10, 10 12 years, and uh, it keeps getting better every year. And 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 the conversation and the and and the diversity of people. And so now we have a session which is an economic history, which is my 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 favorite thing to do. And uh, and Niels and and Paul are going to talk about their their paper on this on the safety net on the balance sheet. Sorry. So I'm just going to say a couple of remarks, take a couple of minutes, and then I can turn it over to them. So the the the, the global financial crisis <coughs> in 2007 to 2008 led to a massive response by the uh, by the Federal Reserve. Um, it expanded its balance sheet in unprecedented and novel ways. And, and such expansions have only really been seen before during major wars. And other countries did the same thing. And quantitative easing, which began in 2009, led to a massive expansion in the balance sheet. And a similar response was, was, was followed with the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. And as I said, other countries did the same thing. And as in the major wars, the massive fiscal and monetary expansion that we just had two years ago led to an upsurge in inflation. Um, moreover, uh, quantitative easing and balance sheet expansion has created new challenges for the con conduct of monetary policy and a call to a return to something like the bills only policies that were followed in the past. Um, also, the lender of last resort credit policies that were followed in 2020 were largely sterilized and did not impact the balance sheet, but they, ha but they may have prevented the market, melt market melt meltdowns, but the extension of the safety net may likely produce distortions down the road. So this, this, this very ambitious paper, interesting paper, takes, an extre takes on an extremely important topic the impact of central bank balance sheet policies, most notably lender of last resort, financial stability policies on the economy and the extent to which these actions may have led to moral hazard. And a, a major contribution of this paper uh, is, is the, the incredible database they put together on the balance sheets of 17 countries going back 400 years and the narratives that go along with that. So along with the historical depth, the paper develops an interesting identification strategy to isolate the effects of balance sheet policy on the economy. So I think the paper has important lessons for the conduct of monetary policy, and I'll let them go forward and tell you more about it. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor indeed for a couple of economic historians to be invited to participate uh, in this gathering of uh, monetary economists. Uh, and it feels a bit, uh, John, like les majeste uh, to talk about the balance sheet, uh, given that it's an instrument other than the short-term policy rate. Uh, and, and that's not really, therefore, the focus of, of the conference. But as Mike says, you can't ignore the extraordinary uh, uh, experimental policies that we've seen uh, since the financial crisis and of course, as Kuroda San pointed out before the financial crisis in the case of Japan. This is a co-authored paper, uh, and so it's going to be co-presented, uh, but I'd be remiss not to mention our other co-authors, Moritz Schulerich uh, and Martin uh, Koniev. Uh, it's been a, a challenge uh, to put together, uh, not least because of the immense amount of financial historical archeology span involved in trying to construct central bank balance sheets uh, from as far back as the 17th century. And Paul, who's sitting uh, next to me, has done a very large part of uh, that work, as he has also done extraordinary archeological work on the long run history of interest rates. Some of you may already be familiar with that from his Bank of England uh, working papers. There's a very important book coming soon that will, I think, fundamentally alter the way we think about the history of interest rates. Let me briefly summarize what this paper does uh, and try to get you out of postprandial slumber. Uh, as Mike says, 17 advanced economies, the usual suspects, uh, 
tracing back as far as we can, uh, really to the origins of the things we call central banks today. That wasn't a term in the 17th century, but there were public banks that played a function not entirely unrelated to central banking. We're interested in major balance sheet expansions, uh, and we define that as an individual country year during which total nominal central bank assets grew by at least 15% year over year. And what we do, and this is the tricky bit, is we, we estimate the macroeconomic effects of such liquidity injections using an identification strategy that isolates an exogenous variable in central bank balance sheet reactions to crises, namely the central bank governor's economic policy orientation prior to the crisis. And so what we argue is that the decision to use the central bank balance sheet uh, in the face of a crisis depends on the priors of the central bank governor or president. And what we've done is a classification exercise. Uh, we've essentially divided them into two bins, doves stroke pragmatists and hawks. And we've done that on the basis of their pre-crisis utterances uh, on the following issues, moral hazard, full employment, economic growth, price stability, exchange rate stability, and income inequality. Now, I hate papers that tell you the bloody obvious, but at some level, this one does. It tells you that hawkish governors were roughly 36% less likely to conduct a balance sheet expansion uh, during a crisis or in the year after the crisis year, which is, of course, not too surprising. What's also not too surprising, uh, though not everybody will like it, is that it turns out that being a dove is not such a bad idea in response to a crisis. Uh, and we use the, a definition of crisis, which looks at a country year cumulative bank equity index decline of 30% of from the previous peak. So uh, in a sense, we give the doves uh, some points for the macroeconomic benefits of expansion. The kicker is that over a longer term perspective, the hawks are not wrong to worry about moral hazard because big balance sheet expansions are more likely to be followed by boom bust cycles. That, Paul, I think is my best stab at a summary of the paper. Okay, we'll show you some pictures now. The story here is the, the demise of a traditional policy tool in the recent past, the demise of the short-term policy rate as an effective tool, the thing that John has uh, spent 30 years trying to educate us to take seriously. And you can see here uh, the story uh, as that, uh, that secular decline from the highs of the early 1980s plays out. As Mike said, uh, our main motivation for thinking about the history of central bank balance sheets is this huge surge that we've seen, and here we just uh, take uh, two, uh, to give you an example, the Feds uh, on the left-hand side, Bank of Japan on the right-hand side. Another way of doing this would be to say the Fed's balance sheet has gone from 5% of GDP to 35% of GDP in the course of the successive crises uh, since 2008. And so this is really uh, what drew us uh, to the subject. Paul, I'm going to hand over to you to, to summarize in one minute and 30 seconds the existing literature. The truth is, if you need a literature review at a presentation like this, it just reveals that you haven't read the paper. Paul? Thank you very much. Uh, we will not bore you uh, with an extensive literature review, but suffice to say that we think we speak to at least two very important strands of the literature. Uh, one is very much um, focused on the post-08 debate in policy and, and within and outside central banks, trying to understand the effects of QE and the efficiency of QE, both on the financial market side and on the macroeconomic side. Um, and it's fair to say we think that by and large this literature has concluded that yes, to an extent, the central bank balance sheet can replace traditional policy tools, the, the short-term interest rate, by raising uh, inflation, by having a positive effect on, on financial markets and by promoting output growth 
However, the uncertainty uh, in these estimates and, and these papers, uh, I think it's also fair to say, is still very large. For instance, the, the existing literature has, has a range of the, of the long maturity interest rate effects of these QE and, and, and you know, the equivalent operations in, in Europe that ranges somewhere from 15 to 240 basis points or so. Um, and, and most of you will be familiar with that part of the literature. There's, there's more of a banking literature that then looks at you know, how have individual sectors of the banking system reacted to taking up these liquidity injections that we've seen since 2008 uh, in the context of TLTRO and these, these programs. But then uh, there's a literature predating 2008 which has you know, taken budget and, and other um, inspirations and looked at the general liquidity provision of policymakers during financial crisis and other tail events. And uh, two very Im important uh, authors of, of that literature are, are on the panel here. Um, this literature has been more skeptical, I guess, um, it's fair to say, and um, has, has analyzed the, the more, more general qualitative uh, dynamics of, of these supports um, during financial crisis over time. Now, we think the two methodological improvements here are that we are the first not only to, to reconstruct central bank balance sheets over such a long period of time, we are the first to then capture liquidity provisions and central bank balance sheet uh, effects at the source. So to do this exercise, you need to recreate these, these maybe not 400 or 500 years, but sufficient uh, periods of time you need to reconstruct the balance sheet itself. And that is the first empirical part that we are undertaking here. And um, to give you a flavor, exactly so. These are some of the sources we are, we are really uh, the first to, to utilize and systematically put together both global central bank balance sheet dynamics and country level balance sheet dynamics. So we are utilizing partly archival sources like the, the one you see on the right, which is from the uh, Dutch archives um, that shows the, the balance sheet statement of the uh, Nederlandse Bank in the late 19th century. But then we, we also go to, to um, Italian, to Spanish language, to German language sources and really try to reconstruct the de facto central bank balance sheets uh, for, for these, all these countries as far as we can go back, uh, relying on, on uh, archival but also printed primary, as the historians like to call it, uh, material. And, and this one on the left is an Italian source, printed source, that also contains balance sheet data for uh, the San Giorgio Bank in, in Italy or the CNE's um, uh, Banco Santo Spirito. And, and these kind of sources we are the first, we believe, to aggregate and put together on a, on a comprehensive level to then take the analytical step and, and analyze the effects at the source for the first time in a comprehensive way. So uh, you'll obviously be thinking to yourselves, being economists, oh, they're lumping together apples, pears, and guava fruit. Uh, but uh, fear not, there's a massively long appendix which explains in agonizing detail uh, how we've gone about this um, and, uh, and made clear that we aren't so naive as to think they're all central banks doing the same kind of things th through 400 years years. In order to make sense of the long run, we do have to do uh, some lumping. Uh, and so what uh, you can see here is that we've got uh, essentially 742 country year expansion events where the balance sheet changed by at least 15% year over year. Uh, and uh, you, you can imagine the incredibly painstaking work that goes into arriving at a data set like this. And I want to make it clear that we're not at this point interested in why the balance sheet expanded, what the rationale was, because that clearly varied a lot over time. You won't be surprised to learn that the phrase quantitative easing is absent from 17th century uh, records, not to mention 18th uh, and 19th century. So this is the, the exercise that we're engaged in. It's a conscious lumping together. Now, what I'm going to do in the next few slides is the summary data, uh, which I think will tell us a few useful things, and then we get to the doves v. hawks part of the conversation. This is the slide that confirms Mike Bordeaux's opening point. 
something remarkable has happened that has caused central bank assets to soar uh, relative to gross domestic product uh, to un unprecedented heights, even when you compare with World War II, which was the last comparably large expansion of, of balance sheets. Uh, and, and I think the, the other important point to note is that there was a period of relatively low uh, balance sheet size relative to GDP prior to uh, the great eruption that we've seen since 2008. Uh, the next slide uh, relates uh, central bank assets to total assets, uh, which is uh, giving you a, a rather different uh, picture. Uh, I, think, I think that speaks for itself fairly uh, clearly. What you're really interested here is that there's this public debt uh, concentration uh, in central bank uh, assets, uh, which uh, isn't so liable to fluctuation over the long run. So when you look at it in this perspective, what we're seeing in our time is less dramatic. The next way of uh, looking at this is looking at central bank public debt assets in relation to total public debt. This is interesting because if you're worried about fiscal dominance, be glad that you weren't around between 1750 and 1850 when it really was a problem. And this is a reminder to economists who are not interested in financial history that public banks, certainly in the eyes uh, of uh, British policymakers were initially designed to be servants of public finance and in particular of war finance. So these great surges in the share uh, of public debt that is in the central bank balance sheet represent the great conflicts between Britain and France of the 18th and uh, early 19th century. I'll have to go at lightning speed because of the time constraint but I'm nearly done. Uh, the last slide I want to show you in this vein just looks at central uh, bank assets relative to the private uh, loan stocks. And this is really ab about showing you the, 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 the relative size of the central bank safety net compared with the whole financial sector. Compared with the 18th and 19th century, the financial sector in the late 20th and, and 21st is much, much larger. And so a critical point uh, that we want to stress here uh, is this uh, relative uh, shift downwards in modern times as the financial sector becomes much larger in relative terms uh, than the central bank balance sheet. Now, one of the points we make in the paper that's worth emphasizing is that in that period where it seems uh, relatively less important, you see the advent of another safety net, if the central bank balance sheet is one safety net for the financial system, the advent of deposit insurance schemes is another. And if deposit insurance schemes catch on, then there is less uh, likelihood that the central bank will have to engage in the kind of balance sheet expansions uh, that we talk about. Uh, the interesting point to note is that on the eve of the financial crisis, there had been a big shift, especially in the United States, uh, to what came to be called shadow banks. And deposit-taking institutions began to matter less. Uh, and this creates a new problem for central banks. They have to shift to being market makers of last resort. So I think one way that we can think about this story is that our safety net waned in, in, in its importance in the late 20th century as a result of the spread of deposit insurance and then grew uh, more important uh, subsequently. So the next step we, we undertake is to really come up with a taxonomy of, of what causes these central bank balance sheet expansions over time. These 742 events that, that Neil mentioned, what is behind the decision to expand the balance sheet based on our definition. So here you see the two most important drivers of balance sheet uh, interventions over time. So we rely on the chronologies that political scientists have come up with to classify war events or geopolitical distress more generally over time. And then also the latest financial crises chronologies that, that are um, in, the, in the finance and econ literature. So um, 
a very important contribution, of course, Reinhard Rogoff, but also more recently, um, Baron Werner's Young uh, published a, a very important paper in the QJE trying to classify financial distress events over time. And so we find basically two-thirds of general balance sheet expansions fall into one of these two buckets, but with very important time trends. So as you can see here on the, on the left, we find that by the late uh, 18th century already, central banks were highly sensitive to expand the balance sheet in the event of a geopolitical distress event. Um, uh, so this predates Badger by almost a century. We can, we can see that systematically these ba uh, central banks, most of them privately owned, but, but fulfilling the function of, of de, de facto central banks, aggressively expanded their balance sheet. And this speaks to the whole debt monetization story that, that Neil was alluding to. On the right, you see that the, the big shift here in the 20th century is that financial crises in the absence of, of, of war after 1945 have become the most important motivation and driver for these central bank balance sheet expansions. Certainly they predate 08 and 09, um, even in the financial crisis realm. So what, what we stress is that QE 08 is not that different actually over, you know, from the perspective of financial history of the long run. We have dozens and dozens of events pre-08, where systematically the central bank balance sheet was expanded. And the point about the, the deposit insurance is that it, it, these are not substitutes. They tend to be activated uh, together, actually. So even for countries that have deposit insurance, um, and I think the, the past couple of weeks are a great example where we have both these, these Fed facilities to, to inject liquidity, but also actions on the deposit guarantee front. Um, and so these actions... Uh, tend to come together. There's no substitution effect uh, necessarily over time. Now on the identification uh, strategy, we, we, um, I, I won't go into all of the details, but suffice to say, we think that we can exploit a, a very uh, fascinating, uh, more recent strand of literature that has studied the interaction between beliefs and macro and financial policy actions uh, more precisely. And so nowadays we know that, for instance, it makes a difference uh, if you uh, grow up during a recession or during a financial crisis. Your so-called impressionable years between the ages of 18 or 25 or so uh, have a massive effect on your lifelong risk-taking attitudes, for instance, or the, the probability that you will um, engage in the stock market, per se, these, these kind of effects. And we think that, well, central bank governors are... Uh, like people, at least to an extent. They, they form beliefs and they form their policy convictions based on the belief set that they develop. And so we, we built on, on that literature and also political scientists who have tried to, to classify belief sets of policymakers and specifically of the governor in charge during a financial crisis event. Uh, he, has he or she has disproportionately uh, uh, influence over the decision to expand the balance sheet, yes or no. Um, and um, this is uh, from a famous paper by a political scientist, Douglas Hibbs, uh, who, have, who has come up uh, with a, a scheme to, to classify these beliefs. And uh, as Neil has mentioned, we, we try to focus on these key macro variables and try to tease out the belief set of these governors prior to the outbreak of a financial crisis, to have a so-called exogenous instrument that, that allows us to, to tease out the causal effect of these liquidity injections. And so, for instance, hawks are, are much more likely to emphasize price stability and currency stability and moral hazard concerns prior to a financial crisis. Um, so the, uh, the, the fun part, from a historian's point of view, is actually finding out what uh, central bankers believed pre-crisis, and this is uh, really what we're paid uh, to do. It was also good to rescue from uh, our collective amnesia the central bankers of the past, uh, delving into uh, the published and unpublished literature to uh, reconstruct uh, their views. Uh, Richard Koch uh, here uh, will be less familiar to you than Jean-Claude Trichet, uh, but we've, ex we've carried out this kind of archaeological exercise for as a, a very large sample of central bankers in the major countries covered in, uh, in the paper. And one of the things I like about it is precisely that we've, we've managed to 
uh, recover some lost names. When did you last hear the name Rolf Kuhlberg or Yunusurke Unue? But these actually are figures who were as important in their day uh, as Jay Powell and, uh, and uh, Christine Lagarde in, in our time. And so here you can see uh, the, the econometric uh, translation here of, of, of these belief sets. And we find that it's actually uh, statistically significant whether you hold hawkish or dovish beliefs going into a financial crisis. Uh, hawks are precisely 36% less likely to undertake a central bank balance sheet expansion conditional on a financial crisis event uh, uh, unfolding. Uh, as defined by, by these existing financial crisis chronologies. And so that probability is pretty much equal uh, in the year prior to the, to the financial crisis, but then you see a very dramatic difference. And um, uh, there's actually a, a group of hawkish central bankers who uh, uh, shrinks the central bank balance sheet during these financial crisis events. But this is the effect that we are trying to exploit then in the, in the second part of the paper, the causal uh, identification, trying to really tease out over time over more than 150 years, for the aggregate sample of advanced economies, what actual effect should we expect and can we consistently measure from central bank balance sheet expansions? As Mike is looking anxious at the time, we'll race through the remaining slides very briskly. Uh, this is the, 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 my favorite, actually. It's all the governors of all the central banks classified by their dovishness or, or, or hawkishness. Do you want to say just a few words about that, Paul? Sure. So obviously, um, we, we, we looked at other attributes that central bank governors have uh, in, in, in these belief sets, and we find that hawkish governors are more likely to come from the private sector uh, before they join the central bank. And on average, they uh, have experienced more financial crises than their dovish, uh, dovish counterparts going into it. So, so we test these other attributes, but we really find that the belief attribute is really the decisive one here. And um, uh, here you have some of the headline results. Um, we do find that there's a statistically significant effect on the money growth, uh, on, on real GDP, and on uh, the inflation side over a short to medium per term um, period following the, the uh, expansion of the central bank balance sheet. And we're talking about a cumulative effect of 15% of, of, the, of the price level in that period, for instance, on the uh, CPI side. So it's a, it's a meaningful effect that, that comes through that uh, balance sheet expansion. Um, now, but there's a flip side. Um, does that mean that unilaterally these kind of balance sheet expansions can, can sustainably replace the short-term interest rate going forward? Is, is, this, uh, is our conclusion that this is the, the go-to tool for the 21st century? Or, or obviously there's a large literature on moral hazard effects. And we try to, to tease out the downsides of using central bank balance sheet over time, uh, over one and a half centuries here. And we find another statistically significant effect that is not that um, a, a pleasant and, and um, uh, affirmative for, for these expansions. Namely, that after these central bank balance sheet expansions, there is a significantly higher likelihood that another systemic financial crisis will come sooner rather than later. Um, and this speaks very much to the, the moral hazard concerns that our hawks over time express and the, the concerns about financial market bubbles that are, that are growing up during these um, periods after, after liquidity injections. So we find that downside very much confirmed and, and we can measure it and say uh, we, we have almost a double the probability that these liquidity injections create a credit boom after the event that ultimately goes bad, bad and faster than it otherwise would. So I think we can probably uh, wrap it up with just two observations. Uh, one is that we're concerned here to think of central bank balance sheets, not as some novel uh, tool, but as a consistent tool of policy going all the way back to the origins, almost the prehistory of central banking. Uh, the other thing that's striking is that the nature of the crises changes over time, whereas uh, there are a great many wars and even revolutionary events in the early part of our sample that are really driving the central bank reaction function. Later on, it becomes far more uh, a story of financial crises. 
there are relatively few pandemics or more broadly natural disasters in our sample. Uh, and that's important because it's very rare for a pandemic to cause as large a central bank balance sheet expansion as happened uh, in the wake of uh, the outbreak of, uh, of COVID. Uh, and finally, notice that the rationales for action vary a lot. The theoretical underpinnings uh, evolve uh, over time. And I think this illustrates uh, that financial history is an evolutionary story. What you're really seeing in our paper is the evolution of central banking institutionally as well uh, as in the minds of central bankers, and we'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Barry's going to discuss the paper. We thought it would look a bit silly if we both stood at the podium as if it was Oscar night. So thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Hoover, for the... Um, Opportunity. Thank you to the authors for um, uh, uh, a very interesting and, and, and complete paper. I recommend that everybody in the room put, put aside two or three weeks to read it. <laughs> There's a lot here. Um, the paper, as we've heard, is on the trade-off between stabilizing financial market intervention on the one hand and moral hazard in, in encouraging additional risk-taking in the future on the other hand. And we all will be aware of the timeliness of um, the topic and the trade-off. To my eyes, the most remarkable aspect of the paper is this 400-year data set on central bank balance sheets and, and, and their correlates. So it, uh, Neil was not uh, exaggerating when he, when he said that his team, led by Paul, has undertaken a really a monumental task here. So I think um, people will be debating some of the results going forward, but they will be in the author's debt for a long time for uh, be beginning to assemble a data set that I think other people will be building on and using. In addition to uh, in, in, in important data, there are important findings. So I think Neil's phrase was, they are bloody obvious but they're no less important for the fact. Uh, the authors show that the circumstances in which central banks expand their balance sheets have changed over time. Once upon a time, they were main, mainly related to war finance. More recently, they have been related to financial rescues. Uh, the authors find that liquidity support during financial crises is stabilizing, but they also find that it raises the p probability of future boom-bust cycles that it is a source of moral hazard. Um, as, as I said, I, I, personally I don't find these uh, findings surprising, but their straightforward nature doesn't make them any less uh, important. The second finding uh, about boom-bust cycles confirms basic economic intuition, namely that financial market participants respond to incentives, sometimes in not always in socially desirable ways. And the first finding of stabilizing effects on financial markets confirms at least my personal view of the importance uh, of cent the central bank as a lender and liquidity provider of last resort. There are many other findings uh, in the paper, and we saw some in, in the form of those pink uh, time series figures that uh, Neil showed us earlier. I think those figures are a little bit of a Rorschach test. Different people can look at them and draw different conclusions from them. So you heard the author's conclusions. Uh, I'm on board with them in, in, in being reassured that fiscal uh, dominance is not obviously more of a problem now than it has been uh, in the past. A more historical reading of this figure would be that it's a reminder of how early central banks were uh, originated as financiers to the state. Our central bank balance sheets in the last decade unprecedentedly large relative to the financial sector? Not obviously, if anything the opposite is the case. And when the authors find that uh, uh, central bank balance sheets have, have grown relative to GDP, that's another way of saying that the financial sector writ large has grown relative to, uh, to GDP. Um, 
some questions about what the authors have done. I start with the most basic question for this kind of historical investigation. What is, what is a central bank? There are four criteria specified in the relevant paragraph in the paper. Uh, an institution established under the provisions of a central banking law. What exactly are the contents of a central banking law? An institution with a monopoly of note issue, not always and everywhere, the Swedish Riksbank, established way back in the 17th century, lost its monopoly of note issue for much of the 19th century. An institution with special responsibility for accommodating the government's financial needs. What responsibility exactly? And here, here's the key phrase. Uh, a, a, a bank that occupies a position as bank among banks. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, an example, so France got a central bank when the Banque de France was established in 1800, except that it wasn't the first banking institution with a range of the aforementioned responsibilities, the, the Banque Generale, the Caisse de uh, Discount established earlier in the 18th century. So this is not a distinctively French problem, this is a French illustration of a more general Problem. So at this point, it would be customary to in, in, invoke Justice Potter Stewart. I think it, the authors in doing so have made generally sensible decisions, but some of them can be disputed, and I'll return to that at, at the very end of my remarks. Um, Paul described how uh, balance sheet expansions were uh, categorized as war-related, financial crisis-related, and you could have mentioned other related as well. That categorization is not straightforward. So uh, I looked for, I thought for example about the Fed's balance sheet expansion in, in, in 1932. Uh, was that a response to the 1931 financial crisis which was largely over by the time the Fed began to expand its balance sheet of March, in March of 1932? Or was it a phenomenon related to congressional pressure in an election year to accommodate the, the needs of farmers and others who were suffering under uh, uh, the, the burden of, uh, of deflation. So if you ask me, I would classify that one as an other balance sheet expansion where I think it's classified here as a financial crisis induced expansion. Um, why go back 400 years if the main thrust of the paper is to look at the stabilizing effect of uh, financial crisis-motivated liquidity uh, injections? The, the main thing that going back in history reminds us of is that the, the motivation lying behind these balance sheet expans expansions changed once in May of 1866, of course, over in Gurney and all that. So you see very few of the, the, the blue financial event related balance sheet expansions before the golden arrow over in Gurney and you see a lot of them uh, thereafter. Um, I'm, I'm a believer, to quote the authors, that a long run historical view is useful uh, for both policy makers, makers and researchers as a complement to studies focusing on the last dec decade, and I'm especially a believer in that when we're looking at relatively rare events. But uh, how long a run should we be uh, considering if there was a fundamental change in regime, in the nature of the, the policy re regime in May of 1866? Um, the, the, the meat of the empirical analysis from which the key conclusions are drawn all look at the post-1870 period because that's uh, the starting point of, of the Schularic et al. macro data set that's used in the, uh, the local projections analysis. Another question, what about Badgett's rule? In other words, shouldn't, we, uh, shouldn't the moral hazard effects uh, of a central bank balance sheet expansion, uh, uh, the boom-bust cycle or not, depend on whether the emergency liquidity was accompanied by a penalty rate. Might we uh, want to distinguish balance sheet expansions accompanied by a penalty rate from other 
balance sheet expansions. Another question, if there is moral hazard from uh, financial bailouts, might there also be moral hazard from emergency finance to governments? So this author, in, 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 a, in, in a book I commend to you, argues that the easy availability of finance to, to governments, in his case, from abroad, the ability to tap global, global capital markets in times of war, discouraged 19th century states from developing their fiscal capacity, their own ability to raise taxes. Might the easy availability of finance from the central bank have an analogous effect? About that instrumental variable, uh, 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 another question. Is it really straightforward to identify the, quote, predetermined ideological beliefs of central bank governors with respect to financial sector support? Among the sources that are, 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 are used in this exercise are national biographical dictionaries, biographies and, and autobiographies, and, and the authors write these were particularly relevant in our approach given their nature as extensive peer-reviewed compendia. Might not those subsequent analysts and biographers have, have uh, been influenced by the actions actually taken by the central banker when in office? Um, another question, uh, who is the relevant central banker here exactly? Is it really the governor who takes the decision as opposed to a committee of board members or the government itself when the central bank is not independent? In the 1920s, Daniel Christensen and then Roy Young served as Fed chairs, but Benjamin Strong at the New York Fed was the loud voice shaping Federal Reserve policy toward the financial sector. Starting in 1930, Eugene Meyer served as chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and he's classified here as a hawk, but George Harrison was the influential president of, of the New York Fed, who was the main mover and shaker in the system's lender of last resort operations. And, and, and the authors cite uh, this well-known JPE paper by Richard Richardson and Proust on the 1931-1932 uh, financial crisis. They compare the uh, actions of the St. Louis Fed, headed by Eugene R. Black, I I'm sorry, head, headed by William McChesney Martin Sr., with uh, the actions of the Atlanta Fed, headed by Eugene R. Black, and they show the much more dramatic balance sheet expansion of, uh, uh, of the Atlanta Fed, which was built on its own earlier historical experience in bailing out the Cuban banking system in 1919, I believe it was, uh, a story for another day. These are the guys who mattered for the different Federal Reserve District responses to the 1931-32 financial crisis. Um, what about the controls used in this analysis? Uh, I was a little bit confused here. The authors control in their local projections for central bank independence, but they uh, cite a study published in 2016 with, which has central bank data starting in 1970 and going up to the um, 2010s. What do they use for the earlier period? Here I can recommend a source actually which traces the fall and rise over the last two centuries of central bank uh, independence. Okay, it's this one which I will share in, uh, in a few weeks, I hope. But just to say um, uh, I have uh, firsthand experience with the author's problem of who and what to count as a central bank when you're trying to trace the evolution and diffusion of, of central banking over time. Thanks a lot. Um, did you want to say something, or should I just go for questions? Well, there are a few things that um, I can quickly react to, and maybe Paul can address some too. Barry, thank you for an admirably thorough referees report, uh, which will be enormously useful to us as we revise uh, the paper. I mean, I, I think the case of France is interesting because there was such a discontinuity there, and, and there's more continuity in the other cases. Uh, France had long, long periods without anything resembling a central bank until the Banque de France was created, not least because John Law had blown the entire system up 
with the Mississippi bubble. Um, I, I mean, the paper does have an other category, and I think the deck doesn't reflect that. Um, the, the, the standout cause of crisis is, is war and then financial crisis, but we have this kind of other category. I think we probably should put that in the main body rather than a footnote, because clearly there, there are, as you rightly say, some political cases that don't fit into either uh, bucket. I mean, it's true that the paper has two different time frames, one of which is the long run going back to the very origins of, of public banks, uh, and the other of which is post Overend Gurney. I, I think there's just no getting away from the fact that this is two papers pretending to be one, uh, and, that, and that second paper is really a post-1866 uh, uh, paper. Um, and I couldn't agree more with you about the importance of, of adherence or non-adherence to Badgett's rule about a penalty rate. And what is clearly differentiating about recent central bank balance sheet expansion is there is no penalty rate, and that, that is a huge... Uh, that would shock Badgett if he were commentating on uh, Bloomberg TV uh, these days. Um, I'll add one more point. I'm eager to read the Quirrell book on pond states because my own um, history of Rothschild, you cited yourself, so I'll do it. Uh, the history of the Rothschild Bank shows that the Rothschild Bank was much bigger than really any of the institutions that we're talking about uh, in the 19th century, including the Bank of England, which Badgett represents as absolutely central. But when one gets down into the the weeds of, of 19th century financial history become, becomes clear that private sector act actors are in fact really, really powerful in the game. Maybe that's also true today. I sometimes wonder if, if Jamie Dimon is in fact the master of the financial system more than Jay Powell is. Paul, do you want to add anything on the specific data points that, that Barry raised? Yeah, just briefly also, uh, thank you very much for, for these great uh, comments. Uh, on the definition of central banks, uh, I would just add that um, it's it's a art, not a science. Not a science, I guess. We rely on some of uh, the most recent uh, books on central banks over time, like uh, Ulrich Binzel's book, uh, who has looked at it. Um, and um, uh, we're going beyond the the idea that if it if it walks and quacks like a duck, it, it's a duck in our. Uh, Framework. There, I would just point to ongoing research um, on policy interventions over time that I did with uh, Andrew Metric, for instance, um, that looks both at the private sector and public sector responses to financial distress. And based on that work, we can more, in a more refined way, analyze which banks have have previously been co-opted by policymakers in the private sector. Um, and, and have been endowed with at least implicit de facto uh, monopolies to react during, during distress episodes. And so we are picking the banks that were seen by policymakers over time, even if they are privately owned, to have a central place in the financial sector over time. Um, and um, we, can, we can weigh that against the other policy options that policymakers had even in the 17th or 18th century. We can show that well, they often activated rules-based interventions as opposed to liquidity, or, or capital injection interventions as opposed to liquidity. But but we can we can balance the private sector with the public sector response from that angle and, and pick the, the relevant um, actors. Um, just on the on the national biographies, that's that's of course a very fair point that we um, naturally in these sources we will have sort of ex post biases um, from from these dictionaries and elsewhere. Uh, we do try to uh, address that and, and check whether contemporary pre-crisis sources and newspapers, like the interviews uh, you saw, uh, do adhere to these ex post narratives. And, and we have a couple of cases in there. Um, I don't expect people to, to read uh, page 126 or whatever it is, but, but we do throw out uh, cases where it's glaringly obvious to contemporaries that someone else rather than the governor is in charge. Australia is, I think, one of the examples where contemporaries were convinced it's the vice governor calling the shots and, and, and the, the existing governor is, is really a, a passive observer of events. We, we do shift around the, the um, uh, governor class in these cases. Um, and um, other than that, uh, on, the, on the Richardson uh, Truce paper, um, we do focus on the aggregate level, but we are very much aware of the regional level dynamics that are going on. And we face a similar problem, obviously, with the ECB dynamics uh, these days, um, where 
interventions might happen on the country level, say in Spain or Italy, that is not always captured by the aggregate ECB balance sheet necessarily. And so we, uh, but, but we, we try to justify really looking at the, at the aggregate level uh, to capture aggregate effects on the macroeconomy, to really compare apples with apples. We think, we think this is the cleanest way uh, possible. Um, and in the case of the Fed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Federal Reserve balance sheet uh, includes the Atlanta Fed and the regional bank uh, liquidity injections in the 1930s or say when, when we capture it at the aggregate data level. And so uh, we would capture if other regional central banks acted in concert with the Atlanta Fed and raised the aggregate level to an extent that it crosses our threshold. Okay, so um, we we'll take some questions. I'd like people to identify themselves when we do. Before we do that, I, I'll just take my one Chairman's prerogative here, I and mean, I could ask a lot of questions, but it's like, and, and, and Neil, you, you mentioned this. Look, e economic science is evolving over time, over this whole period, and that affects the glasses you're looking through, right? Well, how do you really pick that up? I mean, you said it's changing, but in a sense, that could really affect that chronology and how you, you know, pick these guys out and, 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 and classify them. So it's just something to think about. But let's see, I've got... Jeff Lacker, Shadow Open Market Committee, I guess. Um, so first, let me commend the authors for a truly prodigious compilation of material uh, that will be useful to your work and others and many others in the future, I'm sure. You identify central balance sheet, uh, central bank balance sheet size with lender of last resort operations. Now, there's two definitions of the phrase lender of last resort. Well, let me say at least two. Um, one is w w what might be thought of as the classic meaning of Walter Badgett and, more importantly, Henry Thornton before him, of unsterilized lending that expands the central bank balance sheet to offset a drain out of a fractional reserve banking system to avoid a monetary contraction. And this is the sense in which Friedman and Schwartz particularly Anna Schwartz, adopt that. It be thought of as a narrower definition. And uh, relevant to 1932, um, it, it, whether it's lending or purchases of securities is immaterial. Uh, so they would have classified, I think, 1932's open market operations by the Fed as lender of last resort expansion of of Fed liabilities. Now, there's a broader set definition that's, uh, that's around, and it's very common, it's probably the more common usage, which is any central bank lending, whether sterilized or not. And this definition typically thinks of open market purchases, unsterilized, that expand the balance sheet as not lender of last resort operations. Um, and uh, the second definition, as I said, seems to be more common. Now, when you think about expanding the, the financial safety net, it's the lending that, that kind of matters, whether or not it expands the, the balance sheet. So there's, there's a, a bit of a disconnect here. So your measure of balance sheet size includes lender of last resort operations in the first sense, which includes government securities purchases. But it also, um, you know, it also includes those government securities purchases, which arguably wouldn't engendered the same sort of moral hazard problem. And your measure misses um, sterilized lending, which would, of course, have the same sort of effect of um, you know, financial rescue and the like. And this is, but these are often called lender of last resort. Um, this is bound to affect the size of the safety net, what the scale and scope of the financial, part of the financial sector that's viewed as likely to be rescued by a central bank. Um, as, as does other non-balance sheet actions like the forbearance, the capital forbearance uh, in the 1980s um, for large banks. And in addition, FDI rescues are sort of right out, right? They're just not there. So I'm just, my first question is, do these distinctions seem important? They distinct, seem important, but do they, do they affect the interpretation of your results? Second question has to do with central bank intervention in credit markets over time having itself had a conditioning effect on the political system and making, sort of shifting, gradually shifting and desensitizing the political system to large central bank interventions that over time could have sort of softened up the political system for it and, and tilted their preferences, kind of tilted their, 
Overton window or whatever about um, the type of, and shifted their preferences about the type of central banker they wanted to choose. So um, is, is that sort of an endogeneity in the choice of central bankers and their ideologies that would uh, affect the interpretation of the results? I couldn't tell from reading yeah, your paper. No. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll get a couple more. Okay. I'm Andrew, Andrew Levin from Dartmouth College. So re really fascinating work. I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things Barry and, and Mike both said. So um, um, it seems important that the central bank is actually run by a team of experts, not have all the power concentrated in an individual person. And with Mike Bordo's encouragement, I actually read through the entire budget volume, which is, as opposed to what I previously done, which is skim certain parts. So I want to read to you from page 103. It's really relevant, not just for your historical laws, but probably even for today. Okay, so the, at the time, the governor only served for two years, but then he didn't leave the bank. The, 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 pre, the people who had previously served as governor stayed and they formed a standing committee. So let me read to you what Padgett says about this. Um, it was called the Committee of Treasury. And he says, um, um, the influence of the Committee of Treasury is always considerable, though not always the same. They form a cabinet of mature, declining, and old men, <laughs> just close to the executive, and for good or evil, such a cabinet must have much power. Okay, so I think what Badgett was trying to say is that the, the governor did not have absolute authority, that there was a team of experts, seasoned veterans, um, who were kind of making sure that state, things stayed on an even keel. Now, that may or may not be true during all of the period following when Badgett was writing, um, and it may certainly not be true for some of the other central banks that you're looking at over this period. But it, this is coming, I think, to what Barry said, which is now you have this fascinating historical data set that looking at the extent to which there's um, an autocracy you know, run by a single person or maybe by someone behind the throne or where you know, there's, a, there's a, a team of experts um, that you know, makes sure that, that there's wise, sensible decisions. And Chris. Well, thanks. Uh, really uh, excellent paper and discussion. So I just want to build on uh, Barry's uh, comments, and in particular to note that the, certainly the rationale as well as the uh, design of interventions matter both for their effectiveness uh, as well as uh, to limit moral hazard risks. And so you know, in that vein, you know, it matters whether they're uh, conducted to serve financial stability goals, whether they're temporary and targeted. And you know, of course, these are difficult uh, aspects to get at, but I was wondering if you could at least exploit the duration uh, uh, dimension and investigate whether uh, longer-lived uh, interventions, in fact, you know, created moral hazard problems. In a way, these questions are like a research agenda for further work, <laughs> because clearly we can uh, slice and dice the material a good deal more uh, than we have. This has been a a lumping exercise, and next comes the splitting. Uh, you know, one thing that, that we didn't talk about, but you could equally well have asked is, well, what about the other side of the balance sheet? Um, and, and that's something that, that is highly relevant when we're comparing recent events with the past because of, of innovations like interest on excess reserves. Uh, but I, I think in an exercise like this, we're kind of lumping. And we're consciously taking everything, including the narrow and the broad definitions of lender of last resort, and we're throwing it in with war finance. Uh, we're, we're throwing it in with just about anything that causes the central bank balance sheet to expand. The emphasis being the heterogeneity of rationales, the different ways in which uh, these institutions have worked over time. Uh, and I think the next step is to get more precise in answer to Andy's uh, point. Uh, you know, history is really just all about saying it's complicated, and every decision uh, that we want to attribute to the President of the United States on close inspection is, in fact, the result of an interagency battle that is waged in the bureaucratic jungle 
that we call the Beltway. And, and, and in that sense, all decision makings in, in history should not be taken to be the work of the person at the top of the org chart. It almost never is. Uh, and I think what was rewarding about this exercise for me was that it forced us to look at all the central banks over a long period of time and get at least enough acquainted with the biographies of the central bankers to see just how diverse it is. I mean, there were, of course, towering figures uh, at, at the central banks uh, of the 20th century, uh, the lords of finance. But as, as Barry pointed out, it wasn't actually the, uh, the Fed chairman who called the, the shot. So I think this is an argument for digging deeper. Uh, Badgett's uh, well worth rereading. I remember rereading Badgett prior to one of the first of these conferences that I attended and realizing with horror that Badgett would have been against the Taylor Rule. In fact, implicitly, the whole of Lombard Street is a critique of the Taylor Rule before it was even invented. Um, and finally, I mean, I think that what's really interesting, Chris, is, is precisely that we can get a sense of the duration of intervention. I'll hand over to Paul on this, because, uh, I mean, there, there we can certainly provide more, more precision, can't we? Yeah, if I could just add, add one more thought on the on the other two uh, question. Uh, so uh, it's very much the case that we use a broader definition of, of lending of, of last resort uh, among competing uh, definitions, and um, we certainly don't distinguish um, what type of assets are are from a risk profile, for instance, are are purchased in each individual is, instance. So the aggregate size of the balance sheet can stay. Flat. However, you can swap risky assets for for safe assets, and that might make a big big difference for financial markets and and for. Um, we do have that data on a more granular level, as as shown on the government side. We can at least distinguish between safe assets, non-safe assets, and it did not affect our any of our our main results. So that makes us confident that um, it's it's these aggregate dynamics that that are decisive in the end. Um, and then I think a couple of questions go go towards the idea that. Um, it might not really be the governor who is who's de facto in charge. There might a lot be a lot more going on. Um, so, uh, or, or does does the executive, the the government itself, mainly influence? And obviously, it, it, uh, I should add that we we do not consider, say, the Reichsbank during the 1930s as an independent central bank where the governor has the autonomy to expand the balance sheet or not. So we 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 use some of the independence uh, series that, that people have, central bank independence series that people have come up with, but, but we also rely on some research. Uh, Beth Simmons wrote a famous article, I think, on the interwar dynamics where she shows that the, the governors uh, systematically uh, oppose the nominating government policy down the line once they are appointed. Uh, and a couple of other studies uh, that, that suggest that actually the opposite is true, that once, once central, bank, central bankers are appointed, they have a mind of their own, and they, they are not easily um, adhering to some sort of implicit deal-making here. Um, on, the, on the duration, I would, I would just say this is a point very well taken, and, and um, at least for you know, the, the second part of the sample, we should have a pretty good idea and, and work out more, in more nuanced ways um, some of the other attributes of these uh, expansions. So that's that's a point very well taken. So thanks for that. Yeah. I think that we, we pretty well should shift to the next things. I mean, you had a, did you have something that could be fast? I'll keep it very quick. Uh, Krishna Guha, I have a co-partners. Um, I was struck looking at the long historic series that of course you're covering periods of very different monetary regimes, right? You've got pre-gold standard, you've got gold standard, you've got post-gold standard Bretton Woods, floating rates. One might have expected that there may be that there would be some breaks in behaviors associated with these regimes that didn't seem to come across uh, in your work and i just wanted to ask a is that right b were you surprised c are there any conclusions you draw from that well this is a a, a longer a, a answer type question than we've got time for but i think it's fair to say that we've been for some time skeptics about the clarity of these monetary orders uh, paul has a paper which I'm not sure if it was ever published, on the messiness of exchange regime, regimes in practice, uh, that, that, that many of these stories that we tell ourselves about monetary orders are stories. They're, they're what, um, what economists call stylized facts. We historians call them fictions. And, and, and the realities are quite different when one actually scrutinizes 
the monetary regimes in, in practice. And Barry, of course, has written brilliantly on how the gold standard actually worked. Uh, so we weren't really expecting this to be a big uh, sort of uh, predictor of, of regime change. Uh, Paul, do you want to add anything uh, to that? No, I think you, you captured it very nicely. I mean, I would, I would just add, yes, I think we, we pointed out some of the regime change narratives that one can draw from, from that data. Certainly, I mean, the 08, 09 uh, inflection relative to GDP is, is uh, jumping uh, into your eyes. It's, it's glaringly obvious that, that something qualitatively has changed relative to, to output dynamics. But, um, I mean, the point is this paper for the first time, I think, allows to, to look at the question whether there have been regime chains or not, because so much, the overwhelmingly, the debate has focused on 08 and 09 and has tried to draw drawn, uh, structural conclusions, secular uh, implications from, from the policy actions that we've seen. And um, many of these other charts that Neil have shown uh, put doubt on the idea that, that there was a big inflection point uh, in 08 and 09. So, um, that's something we, we try to stress in, in, in the first part of the paper, that, that this idea that something unprecedented happened in 2009 uh, is, is only true in a very qualified sense. Um, okay, I think that's it. I'd like to thank you, everybody, and uh, 